Well, good afternoon, uh, everyone here in the Zoom meeting, but also on the live stream. My name is Sabine Sistronk. I am the president of the Swiss Science Council, and it's my great pleasure to be here together with the academies to a science afternoon panel discussion where we talk about COVID. But we're talking actually not about um, COVID as which we've read plenty in the press and which has basically preoccupied us for the last year. We're actually talking about the research despite COVID and not in COVID. So um, it is my great pleasure to introduce my fellow panel discussion. I'm hearing a background kind of thing. Yeah. Okay, my fellow panel um, members, first of all, there's Christina Uchuguya, who is a musicologist and professor at the Institute of Musicology at the University of Bern. She's also president of the Swiss Musicology, Musicological Society. She's a board member of the Swiss Academy of Social Sciences and Humanities. Our second panel member is Olka sorkin Hornung, who's a computer scientist and professor at ETH Zurich, where she leads the interactive geometry lab. She received several awards for her work in computer graphics, uh, geometric modeling, and geometric processing. Next is Peter Wartz, who is a professor of physics and since 2015, head of the space science and planetology division at the University of Bern. He has been co-PI um, co and PI for many science instruments for space missions of ESA, NASA, the Indian ISRO, the Russian Roscosmos, and also the Japanese JAXA. And last but not least, there's Dominique Chenou, who's professor of computer science at the HESSO Valle since 2010. He has successfully conducted multiple research projects with industry in Switzerland and in Europe. So without further ado, let me ask the first question and I'll have all panelists um, give an answer to that. And I do please ask you, if you have a questions, do not hesitate to put it in the chat. So this should be as interactive a forum as it can be. Put it in chat. We'll call on you during this 30, uh, this 45 to one hour uh, panel discussion. So, Christina, I'm going to start out with you. Corona-induced research and ob obstacles. I mean, we've now been living, been living this with this for a year. So what happened last spring? What happened during this year? Where, what were the main problems? Or were there actually even problems or did we have research as usual? Absolutely, we had lots of problems. The first problem was that our object of study vanished. Music was one of the aspects of cultural life that had to shut down. There were no concerts. Musicians could not uh, talk to the audience and our students and the researchers could not attend concerts either. This was the first thing our object was really damaged very much. And we are a little bit um, afraid about what was going to happen now because lots of infrastructures of, of informal musical infrastructures that are very important may not uh, survive this system, this problematic. And uh, because of that, we have to, I, I personally wanted to make a big project about music and tourism in 2020 and now add music and tourism. And you will see that Corona really destroyed my plans. But the second thing was not only that um, what we are st uh, studying was really affected, but also how we research. You always think about uh, persons in humanities um, sitting in the room and thinking, uh, really, but no, we make lots of field work. We have to go to archives. Uh, anthropologists have to speak to persons. They have to make interviews. And um, the, the, the access to our archives was limited or even prohibited. They had to shut down. I had another project where I made an appointment to get go to the archive in August 2020, and I got a place in April. I had to wait for half a year to get access to the Bundesarchiv in Berlin. And this affects everybody that wants to have uh, archival, to do archival work in such important places. And I see, say also other um, uh, persons in the humanities that also uh, need uh, sources, that need archives, libraries, and 
the others, the other methods like interviews, they had a really hard time. Thank you, Christina. Peter, how did it look for the astrophysicists? Yeah, we do a lot of experimental research. So we have laboratories, we produce instruments for space research. And with the shutdown, everything was shut down. So you cannot work in the lab, you cannot produce your hardware and so on. That was really a challenge. So for some experiments, it meant we were really shut down, shut down for a couple of months, four or five months, and nothing happened. So no data collected, no science done, and, and so forth. For other experiments, which were very time critical, and time critical mean we, we have deliverables towards space agencies, and there's a launch date, and the launch date is given basically by the position of the planets. So we don't care about our small corona problems. So you have to fly or you miss the planet or you miss the comet and so on. So that was a challenge. And I mean, we had the university, the cantonal university. So we have implemented all the safety rules which are given by the canton. We had to develop special plans, special procedures to implement with all these corona safety measures, but still to be operable in the lab for selected experiments. So it was really a challenge. I mean, the building was almost empty. You had four or five people who more or less lived there and the rest home office, a combination of internet exchange, local distance, all this, this stuff to stay in the schedule. And staying in the schedule, if nothing else happens, is already a challenge because you kind of try to build the impossible. Now with this additional complication, it did really not make it easier. But on the positive side, I mean, there was a good spirit The people really tried to accomplish. And it also showed you what you can do if you really want to, if you just work around all these obstacles, the hardships of life, just to make it happen. And that's maybe one of the few good things about all this misery we are going through. Thank you, Peter. We're going to come back to that. Olga? Yeah, well, so listening to the others, I feel really privileged in a way, right? I'm a computer scientist, and I guess the image is always that all we need is our computer, and, you know, everyone is sitting in a dark room with a bag of chips and, you know, programming. Um, so it was, I think, easier for us than um, for some of the other sciences, because we are used to this digital way of working, but... Uh, Still, even for us, just, you know, learning how to do teaching and, and communication via Zoom or other teleconferencing methods was a bit of a challenge. Um, one thing that was quite difficult is to discuss mathematics over the internet. You know, we just discovered that the digital whiteboard tools are not as good as, you know, being at an actual whiteboard together and, and, and discussing, you know, uh, brainstorming mathematics. So that, that was uh, definitely a challenge. And, you know, at least the, the area of computer science where I am in, so that's visual computing, computer graphics, there is actually uh, an empirical component as well that was not possible for us to do last spring. So, so anything that has to do with capture of motion of humans, right? So computer vision, uh, reconstruction of 3D geometry. We had a number of projects on that that we simply couldn't do. Uh, we even asked for permission from, you know, from our um, authorities here in Zurich. And uh, it's just, it wasn't deemed, I mean, of course it wasn't as essential project as, you know, ch chasing uh, the star and the comments, I completely accept that. Um, but yeah, it was just a project that we weren't able to carry out during that time. And any other empirical work on you know, digital fabrication, you know, we couldn't access the lab with all the 3D printers and laser cutters and all that. So, um, so that logistical aspect was definitely frustrating. I also want to bring up maybe something a bit more soft, uh, um, which is the just the mode of working at home really was very bad for inspiration and for getting creative juices flowing. Everybody, I think in the first wave, in the first lockdown, 
everyone was scared uh, in my group. We had a feeling of, you know, something really bad is happening and we don't know what exactly. So that, of course, doesn't allow you to freely, you know, free spiritedly think about science and, and, and do science. And, and then just the depression of being isolated, of not seeing your coworkers, not being able to switch context. You're always stuck in front of a screen instead of, you know, going to conferences and getting excited about other places and other people. And then, you know, that sort of switches the brain to a more creative mode. All that didn't happen. Um, and it's still for the large part is not happening while we're in home office and all the conferences are digital. So that I think is also quite a, a damaging side of, of, the, of the pandemic. This, um, yeah, that we, we, we weren't socialized as scientists, I think to work in this way. And, and, and one year is not enough to, to switch to this digital mode. And I hope we don't have to actually, of course, I also hope that soon this will be, uh, we'll go back to some form of normal, but uh, yeah, that, that has been probably the biggest challenge for, for our work. Thank you, Olga. Yes, we hope so too. Dominique, how did it look like? And it's also, especially with your interactions with industry. Yeah, you mean? As say Olga, I also feel privileged because uh, we are doing computer science, so uh, we are used to work uh, remotely. And for that point, it was not too bad. Um, we had to adapt because for the first, I would say for last spring, it was not too bad because uh, uh, okay, as everybody, we, we were impacted by the, the, the unknown and how long it will uh, it will be. But still, we were used to, to work uh, uh, remotely, and so it was not too bad. Uh, but for the, the mix, so the usual mix that we have with uh, people coming by at our place or going to other places. But um, until summer, I mean, it was OK. So it was much more difficult this winter, because then we, we lost perspective. And uh, we, were, uh, we knew what, what uh, would be uh, to work only at home. And that was much more difficult. And I think the, 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 the morale was impacted uh, la, this winter. But still, so we had to adapt. So if I look at the, the teaching part, so we had to adapt and do it remotely. So, I mean, our, our uh, students are more or less used to, to use computers, remote things, and things like that. It was, at first, pretty cool. And then uh, we started to see some uh, impact on the morale of the people and on the morale of the students. And um, we had to spend much more time just to restore this part. So we had to change the, the teaching in a way that uh, uh, we, we had to spend more time with people or, or small group of people just to, to talk about what, what was going on instead of just teaching. And uh, it worked. So I'm pretty happy that now we will be able to have a, a presential uh, a student uh, this, this next week. And uh, so they ask for it. And so we will have a mixed uh, teaching now. And I hope it will solve this problem. And uh, regarding the, um, the research, as I told you, so I'm doing machine learning and AI and things like that, which is computer science. So it's computers. So we can work from, from uh, remotely. And, uh, but as mentioned, Olga, uh, for, for new ideas and for you know, this, 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 this very interesting part of the research, which is, um, Finding new ideas, finding new new uh, projects, it, it, it was a little bit more difficult. And also, as we are working with a lot of data, so in fact, we're also in relationship with a lot of uh, companies. And so we had to collect this data. And it seems to be obvious, but it is not. So you need to have a relationship with people to do that. The first step is always the same. So you need to know the people and to, to discuss with them. And so uh, we had to delay some of our projects because of that. And so. Fortunately, last summer, uh, just let us solve some of these problems. We were more or less uh, ready uh, for this winter, and it's okay. So uh, the only thing I see now which is a pain is the, the conferences, because even if there are you know, remote conferences, online conferences, it's not the same. So you, when you go to a conference, when you travel, when you meet people, it's because you, you need this, this exchange, and I hope this will be uh, solved this next month. Thank you. Before I follow up with this, um, just to the whole audience, I mean, feel free to turn on your cameras and feel free to ask questions in the chat. So I don't want to kind of follow up on, on what many of you alluded to, uh, but now specifically turn around perspective and look at this for now from a early career 
researcher point of view, a PhD student. Um, how did this PhD education supervision change? I mean, Peter uh, said, so, you know, actually a few positive things. Um, Christina said, you know, what everything happened. So now from their perspective, um, what happened? And also, will, do you think long-term or even medium-term, short-term we know, is this going to influence and diminish the quality of their education and the chances of having a good, in this case now I say academic career? Mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll think I'll start off with Peter. Okay. Yeah. And then with Christina, yeah. Well, I don't think it's a major problem at the level of PhD students because we went through a lot of training already. We have the whole bachelor, master and so on. And for, for at least the PhD students, I see many started as regular students and now we have this Corona environment. But we had to change some things. I mean, for example, as I said, laboratories were not available for a while, so we had to switch a little bit the scope. I mean, it's, it's our duty to enable a good education that we reach a level of a PhD. So that we have the, the level and the international uh, format for carrying a PhD title. So we can always move between experiment and theory and modeling and so on. And so we, we tried for, for all of them to, to really make it possible that we get a good PhD thesis, but we had to adapt. And in the sense of loss, I mean, our main <laughs> occupation is experimental science. And so, of course, these skills did not develop as well, because if you don't spend time in the lab, you don't develop the skills. But overall, I think we can guarantee so far a scientific level at the PhD when, when we finish. What's more difficult is, and Olga and some others already touched upon it, I mean, lots of science is not just you, get, you set this, this, this goal and you just do it and then you finish it and you go to the next and so on. But I mean, we have to go a path. And, and science is you go in a direction where there is no established path. So we enter terra incognita and this is what science is. You push the boundary of knowledge forward and so on. Students encounter problems, how I deal with it. If it just come in my office and we talk five minutes, we might find a path. Or if I talk with them at coffee and we do it, used to do it every day, you, you make sure that we don't deviate too much from what you think the path is. And this is, of course, the supervised responsibility. But now that many of them sit at home, you don't meet them on these informal occasions. And so you don't know when we run astray. When, so you cannot catch them in good time. And so sometimes they go very far until you realize. And of course, you have like daily Zoom meetings, a weekly extensive meeting and so on. But it's not the same. You don't interact in exactly the same way. So like the brainstorming, the spontaneous element is just not as established. And maybe it's not such as established because we have to learn to use these tools. Or maybe it's just impossible on this level. I don't know. But at present, we don't manage at the same level as if I would talk with them drinking a coffee and say, look, try this, try this, or talk to that person or read this paper. And after five minutes, they might be on the correct way again. So in that sense, there is a loss. It probably will not severely impact their life. I mean, we still get intellectual challenges, which we have to solve and become brighter and brighter in, in, in the process. But it's not the same as, as before, I, I think I can say. We think, yeah. Christina? I think there are many other aspects that have to be taken into consideration because now we are speaking as if studying would be uh, something like work to rule, there are uh, courses and this, but I think for the younger students, it's really horrible because studying is also a phase in your life where you make a big, big step in emancipation. And this corona has been a full stop in this process of emancipation. And I have seen our students, how they returned home to their parents because of organizational issues. And I saw them at home with their parents and mommy was going, making a coffee. And I, I, I pitied them very much because it's so important in this first step in your studies 
that you make mistakes, that you get the the bad apartment, and that you arrange it horribly, but you you love it. You 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 put so much of passion and hope in these first steps, and they have been stopped in this wonderful experience. And I pity them very much. The younger, and I think they are not going to to have the opportunity to get it back. And this will will last. This would be. A, 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 the, the, the first steps of the study that it's not possible to return. For the, for the elders, the PhD students, we, they have more experience and so on, but I would include also the master students and any students that have to make their first or, or qualification study. Anybody that had to go to an archive was had bad luck because we had to make a big effort to change for the not so big things like a bachelor study or something like that, where you need three months, half a year. <laughs> this half year, it's, it's gone. Yeah? We had to change the, the topic because we couldn't uh, continue any kind of topic or that was related, that was dependent on archival studies. So that all persons that needed this kind of methods had to change or couldn't do it. And this will really leave a, sc a scar for this time. We will have a year or more than one year where no publications that rely on new archival study will appear. And I think this is, this is very relevant. Yeah. Nonetheless, uh, I think we had through Zoom and as these stud students, we know them longer, we, we could work well with them. But there is another thing that I pitied them for because when I was making my, my PhD, there were moments where I were in despair. I was very hopeless and I don't, didn't know how to manage it. And sometimes I could talk to my supervisor, but it was important for me to see that my peers had these problems too, that I could drink a beer with them or a coffee and see I'm not the only idiot, <laughs> that it's not that it's like, uh, it's not making it absolutely straight and does not have any kind of doubts. And this solidarity between peers was important for me. And I think it's important too for our, our PhD students and this is lacking too. And the last thing is the, 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 the study time and, the, the, and also PhD time was the, the time in my career where I made my basic networks. I, I met um, persons uh, that I am working together today. And now, how can you make a real network that relies not only on hard facts, he is studying the same thing, but also on the feeling, the psychological, I don't know, affinity that you, you can uh, not see in the same way if you don't really have a common experience with your peers. Thank you. That's a very, very relevant point. Again, for the people listening in, do not hesitate to ask questions and put them in the chat, but I'd like actually to follow up on this. Um, so interaction, right? So Olga, how did you interact with your students? What worked, what didn't work? How did they interact within each other? How did they interact with the community? What worked, what didn't work? Yeah, so... Uh, I'm trying to put a positive spin on it, uh, but uh, I'm struggling a bit. So we had, of course, or ha are having our weekly lunches that we do in my group. For me, it work works quite well because my group is small. So it's always been under 10 people in the recent years. And we're currently I think, six or seven. And uh, in, in that format, it's okay. You can have a kind of almost real interaction uh, over Zoom. Um, and of course, I have weekly, at least weekly meetings um, with uh, all the group members and also the <clears throat> bachelor and, and master students that we are supervising. Um, but admittedly, it's, I think many of you already touched on this point, this lack of spontaneity that you can't just pop into somebody's office and ask how are things going. Uh, everything there's this, this added threshold to every meeting right that you need to set it up or at least you need to message the person can we talk now do we have time 
and you know often there isn't time because someone is in another call um that aspect really i think um hinders interaction and and, and slows things down even um we did pick up a lot the use of chat so you know i'm still old generation you know i did my studies without as, as much as a cell phone i think but um the younger generation, they're definitely very used to this uh, rapid texting uh, mode. Um, so, so yeah, so we have a WhatsApp group and we have a Slack channel, we have all these things now. Uh, at some point it was even getting too much, too, too many, you know, online services to, to monitor for, for chat messages. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a continuous struggle, I admit. As soon as it was allowed, we did get together outside um, as a group, again, you know, under 15 people, it was um, possible already uh, last month and we uh, took advantage of it. We had the group hike that was absolutely fantastic. You know, <laughs> it was kind of strange to see each other without any filters, <laughs> without any fake backgrounds. Um, so that was lovely. But I think, uh, admittedly, psychologically, we're all still living in this constant waiting for for it to be over i i don't think we're really adjusting to to this new corona mode and um somebody mentioned conferences this has been an absolute disaster i have to admit in my field so there was only one small specialized conference that was organized in a way that we felt we can actually enjoy it and and learn something but for the most part the bigger ones you know where typically it's you know maybe thousand people coming and you have a chance to kind of experience many different things this was we, we all registered but we we just couldn't really benefit from it and, and barely attended uh the, uh the sessions online it was also always almost always in very inconvenient hours for europe um, so I think that's part of the experience that my group really missed on. And I did, I do have a couple of younger students who never experienced the real conference. And I think they are missing out, uh, for sure. So, yeah, we're waiting for, for that to be lifted. <laughs> Thank you. Dominique, you mentioned the, the new teaching and the hybrid teaching, the students asking actually to come back. Can you explore a little bit on this one with this idea of interaction? Yeah, so the, the idea is that, um, so they asked for, um, so, I mean, teaching uh, uh, remotely is, is, uh, has some advantages. So people can, can you know, uh, follow up the, the, uh, the teaching. Uh, they can, as we record it, they can just go slower or faster. So that, there are some advantages, uh, but they miss the, the, the teamwork. I mean, the, the peer meetings, as, as uh, uh, Christina mentioned just uh, earlier, so the, the peer meeting with people is, is very important. And so they ask to have uh, um, a possibility to be in a class, so respecting all the, the sanitary uh, uh, things. But uh, so what we will do now, we'll start uh, next week, will be that people can meet in a in classroom um, and uh, the teaching will also be done remotely. So they will have the, the projector with me or others uh, displayed on the projector, but they're, they're in the same room. and. Um, we will see if it works or not, if it's uh, important or not. But as far as I can see, so I have the privilege to have also two daughters that are exactly doing a bachelor now. So I can see exactly what Christina told before is that, okay, it's nice to come back home, but you know, <laughs> it's not the same way of life. And uh, if we remember us, so we were, we were of course, uh, uh, well, you know, I mean, uh, learning things and uh, following studies, but we also had, uh, you know, evenings and, and weekends and things that were totally off the 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 the, 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 stu the studies. And this is very important also to build the, the network and to uh, to get emancipated. So I think it's very very important that uh, we we were able to to come back and to put people together and. Uh, and start slowly to uh, to uh, to go to the normal way. Uh, thank thank you. you. Yeah, I mean, I, I think one one conclusion we can all draw about this: the e universities will not ever work. Right? You need to have some way of having some personal interaction. Otherwise, a big part of learning, and here I'm just learning, putting the learning in a bigger sense, 
you know, not just acquiring knowledge, but learning is just going to fall away, right? So, I mean, that's one thing that I probably would take this out. Again, feel free to put questions in the chat because if I'm not seeing any right now, I'll move on. So a little controversial, right? Just, oops. Okay. Jennifer has a question. Jennifer, go ahead. Oh, your microphone, your microphone. Hi, so I'm very interested in this discussion, this discussion as a new national contact point for culture, creativity and social inclusion, as you'll see in my comment there. And I'm interested in what you guys would have, uh, you know, as ideas off the top of your head in terms of uh, solutions to COVID problems regarding research funding. So either on a national level, uh, SNF or I particularly obviously deal more with European funding what kind of measures or things could funding bodies put in place that would either stimulate research, that would fix the problems or go some way to fixing the problems you've had in terms of your, your research? And I realize this is a broad question, but I think it's maybe, well, if we don't have time to discuss it now, this could be an interesting question for yet another discussion. Well, uh, quickly, I would probably ask Peter and Dominique. Peter has SNF and Dominique has uh, European experience. And of course, Christina and Olga too, but let me start with Peter. Well, the, the problem, especially for PhD students and so is there's time lost. But the SNF grants and we also have InnoSwiss grants are time limited. And so I say, okay, there's four months of lab time lost, so fine, but we still employ these people. I mean, we didn't lay them off and call them back when Corona is over. So the salaries were paid, the people did less work, less on the project, less on, on the research question. And when we ask for extensions and we said, oh, no, no problem, you can extend your project, cost neutral. So no, no, no money, I mean, you can work longer for no money, that's fine. Thank you for the generosity. But so we had to come up with internal fund and redirecting money and so on, but there's of course limited resources. I mean, we could from our institute relocate money, the faculty help, the university help, but this is small money compared to the, the big problem. So some basically research needs money, it needs to be funded. If there uh, is a delay because of COVID in this case, it's an external delay, nobody has cause here, nobody is guilty of producing COVID in our situation, but it dis disturbed lots of careers. And, and one thing would just, okay, you lost five months, be generous, give five months. But so far this does not happen. So there's no recognition of, of that. Many people, we, we invest, I mean, the PhD students stays there day and night more or less. I mean, this is a full-time occupation and many are, it was PhD with your heart, so it's not a nine to five job. So we give everything. And when some recognition of the hardships being just paying the salary a little bit longer would be appreciated, but neither SNF nor uh, Inno Swiss really came to a point. Meaning? Exactly the same, exactly the same explanation. So we, we, we were, uh, we had the same problem. So of course, uh, like, you know, Swiss, they say, okay, no problem. We'll give you six more months, but no more money. So uh, we had to go to our own funds. And uh, fortunately, uh, that was possible, but it would not be uh, sustainable uh, for more than the time that we had there. And for the European projects, the same. So, um, I mean, we might need this, this COVID uh, you know, compensation somewhere. And uh, I would have to say in my group, we were fortunate. We could uh, keep everybody and uh, we could, uh, for the project that were delayed, uh, especially for, you know, Swiss were, the companies had trouble, so they, they, they were late. So we were able to, uh, to find other, other uh, projects in between and start again uh, right now. But it, yeah, that's, that's the main point, I would say. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure Olga and Christina will say exactly the same thing, correct? Yeah, I would add one thing else. Uh, mainly you, you are the national contact point for uh, culture and creativity and um, probably also art and so on. And one thing that it uh, has shown to be impossible now is just to quantify what has been the, 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 the loss of uh, the crea creative economics. 
in this time. For, for instance, for music, it's not possible to know how much money has been lost. It's a, a thing that has to do with administration, with the incompatibility of data, etc. So et and I think uh, that, that makes it very, very difficult just to, to say, this is what we need because we don't know, we cannot uh, count what we, what we have lost. And I think that this kind of hard data should be one uh, thing priority. Uh, for the next time that we have the, the really the good instruments to just uh, quantify these kind of things. Olga, did you want to add something? Yeah, I just wanted to add that um, I, I think that some flexibility from funding agencies on all kinds of fronts would be really helpful. Um, one kind of opposite problem during COVID times is if you have a new project approved, it's difficult to hire people. Um, so I've been, I had, uh, for example, an ERC project approved in, uh, or I got it in, in February, but I have enormous trouble recruiting because um, it's very hard to just interview and make decisions based on Zoom. Um, for the applicants, they would like to visit the country and see, you know, that usually the top people have multiple choices and they want to make an informed decision and it's not really possible at the moment so a lot of hiring decisions are delayed and recruiting is is tough so you know not having these rigid structures where you know you have to do certain things by a certain time and, and you know have your team ready as soon as you know snf or erc says go um, that would be i think already quite helpful in some cases yeah, I think, Jennifer, that gave you a lot of answers to your question, because it is a struggle for, you know, I mean, I'm including myself here, it's a struggle for all of us, for all these reasons. Okay, now let me ask a little bit of a controversial question, or actually not that controversial. So we have had quite a few studies in nature and science and others that basically say that um, there is a diminution of publication output or maybe research output of women scientists during this COVID time. So this was of course all collected quantitatively. Um, what do you think? Is this true? It, did that happen to you? And here I'm, I'm just asking, you know, maybe Olga, you know, asking a women scientist, Olga, did it happen to you? Um, yeah, I think so to to a smaller extent. Or well, my statistic is very small, of course, but um, definitely there was a diminishing productivity. Um, I think I'm very very fortunate because um, I have caretaking responsibilities to my children and, and to my elderly parents. Um, but they are shared, or even more than shared, uh, between me and my husband. Uh, so, so I have really, I, I had enormous support uh, throughout the pandemic uh, and uh, we do everything together, the house chores and, you know, the baby, the children and so on. And uh, I, I do see though around me that this is not always the case. Um, so, so I think um, a lot of this uh, diminished productivity has to do with the caretaking responsibilities and it doesn't have to be women, but I guess de facto it is usually the women who carry uh, more of that load. Um, and uh, that definitely, I, I mean, I don't see any solution other than uh, really rethinking, you know, the division of labor. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and in my case, you know, my husband, he's not an academic research. So he has great understanding and support of the, you know, the, of the fact that sometimes I can't you know, I don't adhere to office hours and, and things don't work, you know, in a very regulated manner. So he's able to jump in, you know, uh, and, and, you know, as I said, take over more even than the 50% per se. So I, I think that's, uh, that has been really the key for me to, to handle this issue. Um, and I, I have to say that I also heard from male colleagues who, who have children and, and were caring for them that their output went completely down, at least during the first wave when the daycare was closed and schools were closed. So um, yeah, so I'm, I'm, it's a female issue because of that other thing, right? The, the role division. 
uh, I think it's not, it doesn't have to do with our biology. <laughs> that is true. Christina? I don't have children, but I, I belong to this group of commuters. There are many female academics that came from outside, from other countries that commute because their families, their state in the other part, and we are making this kind of thing. I think, and it would be interesting to, to really make a study if there is a, I think I know more female that do this than male. And this led to, I had to really take the decision, do I want to work or do I want to be with my family? Because I don't have the infrastructure in Frankfurt where my husband lives. And I decided to be here alone. And this was not nice to have, to be obliged to have this kind of decision. And I think it would, would be interesting to know if it's more a female thing or just general, because there are so many foreigners here in academia. Thank you. So if there are not any other questions, so for the last round of questions, you know, let's end up maybe on something positive instead of all the things that didn't go well. It's kind of like, okay, is there anything good that came out of COVID when it comes to research in COVID? Who wants to get started? I'm going to give the floor to everyone. Yeah, I would say spontaneously, uh, um, the, the, the relationships, the communication with international institutions. Uh, I am the Secretary General of the International Musicological Society. And during COVID, uh, we met the first time, uh, or the board completely could meet. The first, the one person was taking his mor morning coffee and the other person was just trying not to get sleep because one was in California and the other in Australia, but we could meet. But it was possible to work effectively only because we knew each other before. And so we decided that we are trying to make now a combination of both things, of this kind of Zoom meetings and uh, others. It, it would not have been necessary to have COVID to, to come to this information. I just want to say this. That's probably true. Dominique? Yeah, so as we are in computer science, so people know that uh, it's easy to work uh, remotely. And now we just figure out that it's also very important to meet each other. So, I mean, we discovered that. So we need that. We need that. We need meetings. And, uh, and uh, I hope that uh, we will restore this uh, as soon as possible. So I think it's the main thing on our area. I hope so, too. Peter? Yeah, with meeting in person, I mean, you said it, we, we had all the lectures, of course, on internet now, and we get the feedback from the students, we would actually come back to the lecture room, like this old fashioned style, having a professor standing down, we're talking, showing, demonstrating experiments. And so somehow there's an additional value when just promoting information, just teaching, as you also said, Sabine. And they came to this conclusion by themselves. We didn't force it to them because for a while we thought, oh, this is kind of old fashioned. So you have an auditorium of two, 300 people filled with students. They all sit cramped there and then an old person like me is talking in front of them. But somehow there's a value to that if you make it well and the students want it. This, so that was good to hear because it's an effort and so on. But it was good to hear that this is appreciated. The second good thing I see, I mean, we have complained about these conferences that we don't work. I fully agree. But at least in my life, we also have really lots of technical meetings and they are also international. So I used to travel every other week, basically, at somewhere, at least in the Western world, US or China or Russia or whatever, more or less every other week. And technical meetings and where you just discuss points through building something, schedule and so on. And we found out that maybe it's not as effective as talking in person, but saving a trip to the US and being a little less efficient at home in front of, of the computer. So, so maybe we will travel less. Maybe we will not to go to all these places and we limit our travel to the scientific conferences, which I think is still necessary to this, this inf Information exchange, the formal at the lectures and the informal in the corridor and whatever happens in the evening when you go to dinner. I mean, 
we are all scientists and we don't know anything else to talk in science. So even a dinner talk is science and actually almost work. So, but if I get rid of like about 70% of my travel by technical means like Zoom and whatnot, that's a good thing which came about with Corona. Thank you, Peter. Olga? Yeah, so I want to echo many things that were said. I think for me, one positive outcome was to learn that at least as a teaching professor, I'm not completely obsolete yet. <laughs> so, uh, so the students really yeah, expressed longing and desire to see an actual live person. Uh, and on the other hand, during the online teaching, so I taught in the bachelor first year, first semester in the uh, fall semester last year, um, I thought that there was actually ultimately more interaction that would, than would normally happen because, uh, you know, I was speaking in live streaming and, and teaching them linear algebra, but also there was the chat. And the students also organized a um, Discord server where they could, you know, exchange experiences and, and, and funny gifts and whatnot. And they invited me over to that one as well. And, and uh, you know, I could answer their questions in real time or maybe be delayed. And I feel like that gave actually more personal communication that would normally happen in a four, 400 people auditorium. So this was quite nice. But at the same time, it was nice to discover that they appreciated not just having a, you know, kind of pre-recorded YouTube class or whatever, but they would like <laughs> to see an actual live person there. Um, then I would like to second the other thing that um, I think uh, internationally, some things became more inclusive, actually. So in my community, people um, started organizing online seminars where very prominent or up and coming speakers would give talks on YouTube streaming, you know, with live chat and questions. And uh, I think previously we wouldn't have access or at least not as much to, to these kinds of events, you know, and for me to be able to hear what's all new and exciting at uh, MIT or Toronto, sitting from my home in Zurich, that, it, it, it was very, very valuable, I think. Uh, and, and, you know, and anybody could attend. So, you know, also young students from China or Australia, or whatever. Um, and then um, perhaps last point I want to say, so since I'm in research in computer graphics, for me, it really uh, cemented the motivation to work on better means of this digital getting together, right? So I, I kept asking, well, where is our virtual reality? Where is our, you know, VR, everybody with, uh, I don't know, with uh, virtual reality glasses and we all can meet in one virtual space. So there are so many research challenges that we still have, you know, in, in, in my field and in neighboring fields that now I think it's very clear that the practical motivation for it is quite essential. Uh, so that's what this pandemic proved and we're very energized and motivated to, to work on these, uh, these things. Thank you, Olga, because that, that was actually, you know, it's the end of our panel, but that made the nice thing back to what Christina said in the beginning of the research just going to go away with COVID of actually inspiring new research um, because of COVID. So I think this was an extremely interesting panel discussion. We heard from four very different kind of uh, fields. And I do see, I think the message to say, we have many things in common. And if not the most important one, that learning and experience, academic experiences, do need some personal component, even though that many things was, you know, facilitated, if one will, because of electronic means. And I have to say, you know, just imagine COVID 20 years ago, we would have been in trouble and we wouldn't have not have had this Zoom and YouTube live streaming to actually at least connect and exchange. So with these final words, thank you very much for your participation. Um, this is going to be, um, sorry, yeah. So, so the science afternoon went online on Zoom because of the pandemic. So Claudia just put that into the chat. So um, see if we do, there is actually an advantage of this. So 
Without further ado, thank you very much for participating. Um, the panel members, thank you very much for listening, for the audience, for asking questions. This will be um, on YouTube if you want to follow this or recommend this to some of your colleagues. And without further ado, until next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Nice Take care.